everybody, I'm Jordan Rolfes from Beagle Rampant Productions, and you know how a lot of people feel really romantic right around Valentine's Day? Well, I tend to get those feelings at the time period right after Halloween and leading up to Christmas. For whatever reason, I just always feel so romantic and in love with stuff at this time of year, so I figured for our Beagle Rampant Gaming Profiles this month, we're going to take a look at some very romantic video games, whether they deal actually about romance, or they could have a wonderful protagonist that I would probably like to be romantic with. And our first game that we're going to be looking at in this series is Metroid, the differences between the NES version and the Famicom Disk System version. Samus is my favorite video game star of all time, and she is my number one video gaming crush, so she is the perfect person to begin this uh, series with. So I hope you guys sit back, relax, and enjoy our little trip to Zeebs, Zebeth, Zeebs, Zebeth. You know, they never actually released a pronunciation guide for any of these planets or creatures, so I just kind of wing it. If I'm wrong, let me know, but I hope you guys enjoy our wonderful journey into that planet. <laughs> For those of you who may not be familiar, the Japanese version of the Nintendo Entertainment System was actually called the Famicom, short for Family Computer System. It was released about two years before the NES made its worldwide debut, and it was a smash hit in Japan. It was so successful that Nintendo decided to go ahead and release an add-on that used the floppy disks called the Famicom Disk System. And I remember those wonderful days when Nintendo would test all of their products in their home market of Japan, rather than having us beta test them over here in the United States. Yeah, it's the Wii U. Yeah, I we were beta testers in America. That that wasn't irritating at all. The game Metroid was never actually released on a cartridge in Japan. It was strictly a Famicom Disk System release. Other Famicom Disk System games, such as Zelda and Castlevania, were later ported to cartridges, but Metroid never had that opportunity, positive experience, negative experience, I'll let you guys be the judge of that at the end of the video. Metroid was strictly a Famicom Disk System release, and if you guys were interested in actually playing a Famicom Disk System game, there are a few things I think you should be aware of. First of all, you would need a Famicom console, so you would have to import one of those, uh, more than likely, from Japan. And uh, a word of caution, the Famicom uses a 10-volt power adapter. You cannot use anything greater than 10 volts. If you do, you will fry out the capacitor and you will ruin your Famicom system. If your house is wired for more than the Japanese or North American standards, if you have 230 volts as the voltage in your house, you are going to need a step-down transformer. Otherwise, you will blow out the capacitor of your Famicom console. The original Famicom had the controllers hardwired into the motherboard, and this gives you less than a foot of reach with the controllers. The reach was very, very minimal on the original Famicom console. You'll also notice that on the back of the traditional Famicom unit, you have switches for channel 1 and channel 2. This roughly equivalates to about channel 95 or channel 96 in the United States, and I don't actually get those channels on any of my televisions, and the ones that do get those channels have horrible radio interference because I live right next to a radio station, so at that point I figured, okay, it would be best for me to import the AV Famicom. You remember how Nintendo re-released the NES in the early 1990s in a sleeker, more stylish design that was a lot more compact and it was a top loader and everything registered a lot better? Of course, the original Famicom was a top loader, but 
they actually re-released the Famicom in that same vein. There is an AV Famicom that uses an audio-visual hookup, which works a lot better for my television sets, because now I can go from AV to RF with no problem. You will notice on the AV Famicom that there are the standard NES-shaped controller ports. At this point, the controllers were no longer hardwired into the motherboard because they realized that was a pretty terrible idea, and they had the more basic NES-style controller slots. And we have this port on the side, which was actually used for the Zapper and the Rob unit, which in Japan, the Zapper actually looked more like a straight-up revolver, and in the United States, it looked more more like a futuristic ray gun zapper thing, hence the name zapper, I guess. The Famicom disk system itself is connected via this RAM adapter that you plug inside the cartridge slot. Now, there is a load screen for the Famicom Disk System, but this does not mean that your Famicom Disk System is functioning. If you're able to see this load screen, you could still have quite a few problems with your Famicom Disk System. And this is a very persnickety and a very problematic console. It's a downright nightmare to work with sometimes. You could frequently see error number 22, which means that the belt is broken or decayed, and chances are you need to go ahead and get a new belt. So I recommend, if you're going to import a Famicom disk system, you're going to want to go ahead and make sure that the seller has mentioned that the belt has been replaced, and you may even want to see video of the unit playing software functionally. Metroid had an amazing development team with director Yoshio Sakamoto, who directed balloon fight, and he would later go on to direct the WarioWare series. Sakamoto is referred to as Yamamoto and Shikamoto in the credits. For whatever reason, in this time period, developers never use their real names at the end credits, and it makes it really difficult to actually find out any information or do any sort of historical research on these games. Uh, yeah, that... Uh. That was a fun thing they did. Character designer Hiroji Kiyotake actually came up with the design for Samus. And the reveal that Samus was a woman was rather shocking back in the day. The instruction manual refers to Samus as a man, so when you beat the game under a certain time limit and it's revealed that Samus is in fact all woman, it was definitely shocking uh, during the 1980s. Believe it or not, Samus was actually not the first female protagonist in video games. There were a few releases for the PC that involved Alice in Wonderland and The Wizard of Oz, so the honor of first female in video gaming would actually go to Alice or Dorothy. Now, we could say that Samus was the first independent heroine of video gaming, but that isn't exactly true either, because there were a few Japan-only releases that starred female protagonists that were in their own series. We could say that Samus was the first female protagonist in video gaming that gained international reputation. Of course, my first experience with Metroid was actually with Metroid 2. I actually discovered Metroid on an airplane. Our family was flying out to Las Vegas, and my sister had Metroid in her Game Boy, and I had Dr. Mario in mine. And we looked over at each other's screens, and we were like, do you want to switch games? And we were like, yeah. So then we go ahead and we switch games, and I fell absolutely in love with Metroid at that point. And it happened while I was traveling, so that kind of explains a lot why Beagle Rampant Productions is pretty much travel on one end and video gaming on the other end. It's These foundations came about when I was a young child, and I just can't break them, and I don't want to break them. It's who I am, and I'm happy that this is who I am. The scenario for Metroid was written by Makoto Kano. They wanted to do something that felt very much like the Alien series of films. The boss Ridley is, of course, named after director Ridley Scott, and they wanted something that had a maze-like and isolated feel throughout the game. And, of course, the game was produced by Gunpei Yokio, who developed the game Game & Watch series and was actually instrumental in inventing the directional pad on controllers. Now typically the stories you hear about Gunpei, yeah, he was kind of 
hard to work with. He was a very unrelenting boss, and he would often kind of bark at the crew and say, Are you lot trying to make a work of art here? Come on, we got deadlines to meet. And Sakamoto, of course, was an artist. He... His experience was within the Osaka Design School, so yeah, he kind of is trying to create a work of art here. For me, the most noticeable difference between the Famicom Disk System and the NES versions of Metroid come with the audio. Typically, the Famicom Disk System versions are a little more instrumented, if that's a word, and that's because the Famicom Disk System was able to produce better sound capabilities. The main theme and the credits theme are most notable for their additional instrumentation. There are also noticeable differences between things like getting items. Certain enemies, especially the Metroids and the bosses, sound very different. The screw attack sounds are different, and there's an interesting thing about the screw attack. Kiyotake was a very athletic person, and typically the development team would actually go out and play soccer sometimes to sort of take a load off and to decompress for a little bit. And uh, Kiyotake wanted to experiment with having your entire body used as a weapon, and I think it was a very successful experiment because screw attack is probably my favorite weapon in the history of video gaming. I just love screw attack so much. And of course, more audio differences. The doors opening are totally different. I've always wondered about the sanity of the native races of all of these planets that Samus goes to visit. I mean, in order to open a door and go to the next room, you have to use firepower and artillery to access them. I mean, has anyone else ever wondered about this? That Samus has to shoot all of these doors to get into the next room? I mean, that just doesn't seem safe for your society. If you want to go into your garage, you don't go at it with a machine gun. When you beat the game, the alarm sound is different between the Famicom Disk System and the NES versions. And I have to say, the Disk System version is a lot more irritating. Now, let me just say, the fact that you had to escape really quickly after defeating Mother Brain absolutely freaked me out when I first played this. I already knew that Samus was a female, so that wasn't the shocker for me. This was the shocker. When I beat a final boss, I kind of expect to see an ending screen and relax a little bit, but all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I gotta get out in a thousand seconds, so it is certainly a generous amount of time to actually get out, but still, it definitely threw me for a loop when I first played this, because, as I mentioned, my first Metroid game was Metroid 2. That is one of the only ones that does not have an escape part. Another difference between the Famicom Disk System version and the NES version of Metroid is the loading times that you'll have to sit through. Yes, in the Famicom Disk System version, there are quite a few load screens, and these load screens are long enough to make you wonder, oh no, is my machine broken? But they're not long enough for you to make dinner, or text your girlfriend, or do anything particularly useful. So it's just enough to give you a mini anxiety attack, but not enough to actually accomplish anything that you may need to do in your life. And it's especially irksome because right after you beat Mother Brain and you go up the elevator to the credits, 
you have to sit through a very long loading screen, and then you actually have to flip over the disc, because on the Famicom Disk System games, they are two-sided, and on Metroid, the saving and load screens are on side A, and the actual game is on side B. So when you beat the game, you have to sit through a loading screen, and then you have to take the disc out, flip it over, and then put in side A to actually see the ending. So by that point, any excitement you actually had after defeating Mother Brain, which is still a challenge to even the most seasoned of players, Mother Brain is difficult. So after you're done with that excitement, you have to sit through load screens and flip your disc over, and by then you may have stopped caring, or you may have fallen asleep, which did happen to me once. One very fatal flaw for the Famicom Disk System version is the fact that you can't play as Suitless Samus after you beat the game. In the NES version, you have this wonderful mode where if you beat the game in a certain amount of time, you can actually play as Samus without her suit, and it's fun, and she looks pretty straight up 80s in this getup. But in the Famicom Disk System version, you see a bunch of money bags on your save file to indicate that you have actually completed the game, and the number day here actually means this is the amount of hours that you played, but overall you don't get anything special after you beat the game in the Famicom Disk System version. And let me dispel this myth right here. Kill mode is not an actual mode of the game. That is what you click if you want to erase your file. And you can imagine my disappointment when I discovered that. So overall, when we add up everything, yeah, the Famicom Disk System version does let you save, and that's pretty cool, and it does have better audio, so that's also really cool, but if you can't play as Suitless Samus after you beat the game, and if you have to sit through these really long loading times, I have to wonder, is it even worth it? So I have to give my vote for the NES version here. I much prefer the NES version. It could be because that's what I grew up with, but there's just so much more to do with the NES version. And while entering passwords is a little bit difficult, it's not that difficult, it's 24 letters, people, but the passwords actually give you a lot of opportunity to do some interesting things. For example, you can type in the code Justin Bailey and start out with Suitless Samus. Apparently this was uh, sort of an Australian slang thing that she's just in her Bailey bathing suit, but none of these passwords are actually hardwired into the code. There's only one password that actually is programmed into the Metroid cartridge. And I was wondering, actually, Justin Bailey, I thought it was somebody's first and last name. So I went ahead and figured, okay, is Jordan Rolfus a password? And after using a password generator that I found on the internet, I'll put a link down in the description below there, I discovered that, yes, my name is a password, and eh, it starts you out in an okay-ish situation, but not the best situation to win, probably. You can also enter this password that uses a very bad word in it, and it will absolutely make your console freak out. This is an undesirable thing to do, and if you're playing this on the 3DS version, I recommend not doing it because you could probably do some pretty serious damage to your 3DS console. And of course, there's the North American Regional Password, the NAR password, 0000, whatever. And that is the debug mode, which gives Samus infinite health and uh, pretty much all of the power-ups and abilities. And this is the only password that is actually programmed inside the Metroid cartridge. Another interesting point about the Metroid cartridge is that the NES version was actually supposed to have a save feature. We see that this is the first NES game to actually use the saving circuit, but they went ahead and went with the password system instead because using the necessary battery backup would have cost too much. So they went ahead and just decided to go with the password, even though the saving circuit is there, and Metroid would be the first NES release to have that saving circuit integrated in there. There is even a password that you can enter that defeats Mother Brain. 
Once Samus climbs through all of these dark and scary corridors and fights all of these horrifying monsters, she will discover that the main objective of her mission isn't actually there. And of course there's no countdown because Mother Brain is the trigger to set off the explosions, so... I guess she's gonna go out for pizza or something? And speaking of going out with Samus, would I actually want to go on a date with Samus? I've established that she is my favorite video gaming crush, but it isn't just because she's beautiful. When I say go out on a date, I want more qualities than beauty or attractiveness. I want someone who I can spend some quality time with. I want someone who is of the same mind and spirit as me. I want someone who I can talk with, someone who I can laugh with and interact with, and can I do that with Samus? I think the answer is yes. And you can take a look right here at all of the potential dates we could have. She has a creative and philosophical edge to her. She is willing to introspect. We don't see that so much in this game, and we don't even see it in my favorite installment of Super Metroid, but we see it a lot in Metroid Fusion and in Other M. And an interesting thing about the etymology of Samus. Samus is a version of the Irish name Seamus, and Aran refers to the Aran Islands. I'll admit, when I was little, I used to think it was Middle Eastern, and I went around calling her Aran, but no, it's actually Aran, which would mean her name literally translates to someone who supplants the islands. I would be really happy to date her. I wish I could, but, you know... There's that problem of her not being real, but Samus is really a wonderful character and someone who you could really look up to. So my question for you guys, have you ever played the Famicom Disk System and the NES versions of Metroid? Let me know what differences you notice, what differences I forgot to mention. Like the differences between the text and all that, yeah, the Disk System version tends to favor blue and the NES version tends to favor yellow, I forgot to mention that. But I just now mentioned that, so there we go. But anyway, mention down in the comment section below well, what sort of differences you noticed, did I leave anything out, and would you guys want to date Samus? I mean, I can't really think of any other more eligible Bachelorette, I mean, and while our fan base is really quite small, I definitely need some people to click that subscribe button there. I absolutely adore every one of you guys. I have the best quality of fans of anyone on the internet, and I really appreciate everything you guys do for me. I appreciate you guys watching and liking and commenting and subscribing. Let me know if you want me to continue this uh, month of romance games. I'm really happy that you guys watched this video. Thank you so much for all you do for me. It really means a lot to me. I'm Jordan Rolfes from Beagle Rampant Productions, and I will catch you next time.